on that council and then some of their activities. So um, please put the word out if you're here uh, to the ground. If you can direct anybody over there to get involved with their projects, they would welcome that. And last, I attended the parent math workshop in the morning. Um, by Mr. How do you say his name? Flournoy. Flournoy. Yes. Um, which was was wonderful. Uh, I was really glad to see this, and glad that those are going to continue. And I would encourage uh, parents of the elementary students, in particular, to um, take those in, as they can cover. You know, they're small bites, but they're useful, um, use eye-opening kinds of uh, uh, reviews of how math instruction has changed since you were in school. <laughs> And it would be helpful for you to work with your children, knowing some of the things that he's sharing. So that's worthwhile. All right, so we're going to move right into your reports and get on to the budget presentation. So, I'm going to turn was there any welcome to that? Parent? Oh, I'm sorry. Was there any welcome to that parent? Was uh, not yet. We're in process. We're in discussion and we're doing some research. Um, any other questions or comments before we move into the reports? Over to Jeff and Bob. Okay, thank you, Susan. So, um, just want to draw your attention first to the um, the packet we're working on the budget. Um, I want to start by saying, don't panic. All of you sitting over there on the, on the sidelines, you see those numbers. Um, we typically don't do it this way. Most of the time, the public and the school committee, even they don't see all of these numbers that we have here for us. We sort of pare things down um, before we bring them down. And the reason why we've done it this way, a couple of reasons. One, um, you're in the school committee, and so we are, as you know, we may have to educate you as we go along talk to you about the budget process from the ground up and how it gets developed. So that's the first thing. The other thing is that as we as we start working through these, I don't know if I want to say post-pandemic budgets, um, you know, we think it would be negligent on our part not to show you um, in the community the, the entire rhythm to the needs. And we realized that a town may not have the capacity to support the goal in one year, but we want everybody to see it. Not just in town, not just the school committee, not just the board of select. We want everybody to see these numbers. And um, and then we go from there. You know, these we get requests from the town all the time. They do their calculations and they figure out, they calculate what, what the town capacity is. And we understand that and we try to work within those and within the, um, the, the policy of the school committee. And I just want to spend more up in the drive, but policy DVD, budget planning. <coughs> Excuse me, the first, very first line says, the first priority in the development of the annual budget will be the educational welfare of our children and our schools. <coughs> However, the district will attempt to balance the valid interest of the taxpayers. And you know, our job as a school district is to make sure that we we procedurally do what the school committee policy is asking us to do. If you look at if you look through if you look through the packet, you'll see that the theme, and the theme of this budget is an investment in the people, an investment in our personnel. And so you'll see very little investment in this budget into uh, applications, concrete things, computers, things of that sort, which usually do appear. Um, and we came to this conclusion <clears throat> because we had some time this year to stop looking over the last 18 to 24 months when the pandemic. And two things really came from that. One of them is that the district improvement plan, which is what we work off to generate a budget from, what the school improvement plans come from is what all of our goals are developed from. It's very fragmented. And we know partly that because um, while well, we saw how blurry eyed you were when we were presenting it, because we know that you know, as a committee, you, you really didn't have a hand in it. Uh, you didn't have a hand when you developed it. 
and it would be difficult or whatever. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the other thing was um, we found that there's an enhanced need for um, personnel to work with our students, to work on the cognitive anxiety, the depression, all of these things that have come to light during, during COVID. And now, now, that's not to say we didn't have this stuff before. But just like COVID is with a person, if you have something in you, you have asthma, it will, it will take advantage of that. So all of those things that we saw before in the district have just now been enhanced. And so the need for additional personnel to deal with the social and emotional needs and to continue to expand the program in the district um, is really critical. So um, what we plan to do for the future going forward here this year is um, starting in March, we will develop a, a new district improvement plan, a three-year sort of transitional district improvement plan. We usually start the process around March, so it would be you know, around the time we're figuring out this budget. And then you know, we'll finish it up in the summer and, and bring it to this school committee for a vote so that you can have some ownership of it. You know, you don't, uh, we didn't believe you really had ownership of the plan we were working on. And again, it's very fragmented. See how many colors are on it, how many changes have been made. And even we have some trouble following them. that. So we'll have a new plan. Um, many of the budget items, or the budget items that don't make it through on this budget, the ones here, they're still important. But you'll see them again in the, the three-year district. They'll appear some place there and they'll be prioritized. So you'll get to actually see them again and ask questions about it again and, and, and make some more decisions about it again. Um, so tonight, though, we're going to present the budget as it's written here for your consideration and for your discussion. Um, we'll take questions tonight. There will be we provided brief explanation of each of the items which we usually don't do, and so we'll expand on that a little bit more. And obviously the principals are here, the directors are here, they'll, they, can, they, can, they can answer questions. Um, we decided to present it like we do the district improvement plan because we really are trying to tie all of this together, the budget with the district improvement plan, and, and, and for it to reflect the needs of our students. Um, you know, we realize at the end of the day that we'll have to make some cuts that the towns don't have the capacity for, for these kind of percentages. Um, but I will tell you, we, you know, in, in 2019, when I presented the enrollment reports, some of the trends of building, building, building in these towns, and um, some of the trends in enrollment and birth rate, exempt the first time in, um, in the last 10 years that the Average has changed at the birth rate. For example, in Boston, it's going up from 35 to 42. Um, so, <clears throat> with that comes, those kids are going to go to school someplace at some point. And, and you know, we're going to have to deal with them. So, these numbers of 2% increase, 2.5% increase, I don't know if they could be, but those kind of increases will become more and more unrealistic as, as this town grows. Towns around us have seen the same kind of pattern. And if we don't do something before then, we'll see those 26, 27, 28, 29 in the class. Um, we have an ELO population that's almost quadruple in <coughs> one year from, from countries that I don't even know how to pronounce. Um, so to think that this is going to be the only boil skin. Past year. Are you okay, guys? I'm okay, thanks. Um, it's, it's, it's really not realistic. And again, many of these many of these things we've seen, the social emotional needs of the students, they're just increasing. Um, so we're gonna go through the presentation and again, we'll take some we'll take some we'll take some questions. Um, I do want to point out something else that you might say, well, why don't you just why don't you just take that stuff out now? Again, we want you to see the cost of we also the real cost, but we also want you to realize, you know, we could have taken some things out and you won't have seen them. Bob is going to talk tonight later on about things like reducing the budget using school choice money. 
<coughs> that stuff you may not see. So it would reduce the budget. You probably won't see it reflected in anything in personnel or program. But it will come back. You know, this is the kind of thing that comes back to haunt you. It's like it's like you're gonna build a house and so and you and you know the framing crew says, you know, it's gonna cost this, and you're like, well, that's too much. They say, okay, we can get the cost down. And they take 40 or 50 studs out of the wall. You never see them. But there's an impact and there's a payment somewhere down the road. At some point, payment comes due. So we're going to start, and the way we're going to do this, um, we put it all on one sheet for you to see. Uh, the directors will present. We'll talk about each item in addition to what's written. And then Bob will tell us how we're going to pay for it, line by line. So, um, Karen, we're going to start off with the uh, level service items and, and special ed items are on top. And, Yes, Bob. Okay, uh, just bring the difference between the top section and the bottom first for people. Sure. So, um, well, level service. Seconds, Bob. Well, so level service budget represents basically our existing resources and programs um, and um, contractual costs. Uh, so, you know, teachers union contract other contractuals. It also includes our, our legal obligations under IDA special ed requirements. So we might be adding a paraprofessional or an out of district tuition. We're legally obligated to pay for those. It's in addition to the budget, but it's part of the level service budget. The above level service requests are discretionary decisions. We have the ability to make and add. We really don't have uh, discretion on the above level service requests. Uh, these are things that um, are basically required or they're in our core programs and services. So that's kind of the difference. We're going to start off talking about the um, level service budget. Karen. I'm trying. It's old, I swear, everybody. <laughs> um, so the special ed out of district tuitions, we've had a lot of movement this year. We've had um, three new students move in who were already had some pretty significant out-of-district um, placements in place. Um, and so this year we're not paying for those tuitions, but next year we will be responsible. So those three hit, as well as one of our own students who has had to go into an out-of-district placement. Uh, we also have some special ed paraprofessionals. As we were doing, um, as we are out through COVID, we had a lot of our pretty significant students who couldn't medically come into the building and a lot of those students had one-to-one -one paraprofessionals for health reasons so the paraprofessionals as new students moved in we were able to use those paraprofessionals for our new students but now these students are coming back into the school from homeschooling so we need to go back and replace those paras that we didn't hire in the first place so that's why we're getting hit with a few for next year. Um, and then contract services was just, there's a little bit more OT services, especially in loyal sit. We've needed more, um, not a significant amount more, but um, still impacts the budget. Do you want to talk about the amounts, Bob? Yeah, so um, I, I'm just, uh, in total. Can you still make that larger, Bob, at all? Can you bring that up another notch? Does anybody uh, want a paper copy? I, I, I do have a paper copy, but okay. I'm wondering if you can go up one more notch. Yeah, I can do that. Does that help everybody? Is that better? So we, we deviated from our, our, our PowerPoint format this year. We, we thought there was a lot of information to share and wanted to try to give a picture of the district on one page. Um, and uh, so this kind of gives a, a high level sense. So the, the special education tuitions, Karen talked about, I think there's actually a fourth that um, moved in this year. I could be wrong. I think so there's four students um, in the top line uh, special education tuitions. That's also transportation. We're legally required to pay for transportation for these students uh, to their placements. So the combination of um, those four placements and transportation is six hundred ninety thousand um, dollars. That also includes um, inflationary increases that are approved by the state um, every year. The paraprofessionals is five paraprofessionals. There's two at Tahanto and um, 
three at Boylston uh, for one-to-one -one student needs uh, that are uh, required in the IP. And special education contract services is relatively minor compared to those. In total, this makes up 4.5% um, of the 7.3% increase. Our level of service budget uh, would have been 2.8% uh, if we didn't have uh, these, these costs. So that's the impact of um, of those additional expenses. Can I just ask a quick question to clarify that first line item, the almost $700,000 is for four students. Is that what you said? T tuition and transportation. It's almost $700,000 for four students for tuition and transportation? Yes. Um, One placement can cost up to $300,000. Um, in fact, I believe we may have one that is 300 that we're paying half within that number, plus transportation. Kara, um, how many of those have just moved in? There's th three, and Bob's question, but there's three that have moved in and one that is a student here who has had to go out. Is that the number you have, Bob? Four uh, total? Four, yeah. Okay. I know off the top of my head that one program is 180. It might be a little bit more than that with the paraprofessional added to it. But. So if I may ask the question on Howard's role here in finance, this is a naive question. Can we ever run special education here in the building and not have to transport out and pay it externally, but bring in a special ed teacher in one-on-one? -on -one? Is that, does that make sense at some point? It, it doesn't for these children. So we did that actually in Boylston. We created a program for some of our students where it did make sense. We had about four, I think four originally that we thought might meet out of district placements, which was plenty to create our own classroom and bring our own teacher in and create the program. Some of these students need such highly specialized things that it's just not cost effective to do it as expensive as it seems to recreate that kind of program for one child would be much, much harder. One-to-one um, -one nurses, things like that. So um, these really are where the students need to be. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Margaret. I was kind of just trying to recognize you. <laughs> it's hard with the mask. <laughs> Question on special education circuit breaker. So, um, what is the what is the frequency, or at what point is the school district reimbursed um, through um, special education circuit breaker or other state state aid to reimburse some of these costs? How 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 does that work? We get reimbursed the year after we incur the costs, and it's we get reimbursed for uh, sixty five to seventy five percent of the costs above approximately $65,000. So we absorb, um, it's actually four times the per pupil expenditure rate, which is about 65,000. So that's absorbed by the district first. So if they have an out of district placement at 65,000, we're not gonna get a penny for circuit breaker. And for what's above circuit breaker is 65 to 75%, and we would receive that the year after we incur the costs. Best practice is to uh, budget on <clears throat> what you've received in circuit breaker in a given year and plan to use it the next year, which is what we've done. Uh, in this budget, we plan to access some of next year's circuit breaker money, a little bit, um, a portion of it, which we would uh, typically do, but we feel like we're in a position where we need to do that. Um, and I will talk more. I think Jeff and I felt like there's a lot of information to absorb tonight. We wanted to talk about risks and opportunities at the January meeting. Um, there's some things that could be um, potentially additional expenses. There's some things that we might we might identify ways to potentially pay for some of this. Um, we also might get new information that some of these costs uh, are going to change. So, you know, that, that'll be something we look at is, you know, can we access Circuit Breaker more um, and other things. Thank you. The next item up here is the teachers union uh, contractual increases, um, and that's uh, 236,000. That, that's for steps and lanes on the scales. I think people have seen. Um, so steps and lanes, plus we've assumed the 2% uh, cost of living increase. Uh, the next three items I'll talk about too, because they're, they're, they're related. 
the healthcare benefits, we were given guidance that um, we should expect a little bit of a heftier increase here this year based on our claim levels. Um, they have formulas that look at our claims relative to our premiums and uh, we're not doing, uh, we have significant claims. Uh, so they estimated, said to, to, to suggested using 8%, it's possible that we'll get less. I, I wouldn't imagine we'd get much more than that. They usually have a range. Um, this also reflects changes in enrollment. So um, we have factored in kind of the most up-to-date enrollment levels we have. Um, so these aren't necessarily all going up eight percent. For example, Berlin has memorials had less enrollment um, than we anticipated during the year. So that's a lot less than a, a eight percent increase. I should also note, uh, just format-wise, these percentages represent uh, the the percent increase over last year's budget. What they what they contribute to the overall increase of six point four percent. So that's what these percentages mean. They don't mean it's uh, three point nine percent more than last year. Um, so the the reason for another another factor on the healthcare benefits is last year we had uh, a free month of healthcare from uh, our insurer. Uh, they gave us a, a one month premium holiday um, and we took that savings and we didn't just subtract it from the budget because then we'd have to add that this year plus we have to add these increases. So what we did is we took that savings and used it to make a larger OPEB contribution and we used it to fund the special ed reserve. So these decreases of 121,000 kind of tie in with this increase. This increase would be less if we um, had budgeted, we had shifted one month to, to cover these two line items. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so so the, the net of these is, is overall a relatively small increase of uh, $50,000. Um, I think uh, Carol's gonna, I'll, I'll talk about the last item and then Carol's gonna talk about the, the math tutor and what that represents. Uh, we, we just had some uh, different changes in contractual uh, pricing. We've also uh, used Zoom during the pandemic. We're still using that. We're, we're using a, a, a filtering program for Chromebooks for students at home. Previously, um, they were in district and we've gone one to one and they're now students are taking them home and we're required for the Child Internet Protection Act to provide safe browsing uh, environments. So we have a program called Bloxy that does that. So, um, and, the, and we've also had a, uh, you may have experienced some problems calling into Tonto. We've had some challenges with the phone system. Uh, it's old, uh, the wiring's old. We have a vendor that will support all aspects of telecom that factors into the Tonto increase. So that's contributing 37,000 to the overall total. Um, and then Carol's gonna talk about the, uh, the math tutor and what that represents. Yeah. The elementary math tutor, uh, math coach coordinator position has been in place. This is the first year it's been in place. The position was voted on by the school committee last year. Um, and that position essentially supports the elementary teachers, works on instructional practices, um, works on with the principals and with the data, um, and basically supports anything to do with uh, math, the math teachers to reach the elementary level. And it's also and this it's a new position that began this year, um, and he, that person also works on building community engagement, um, as, as Susan mentioned earlier. So we're excited about the position, and um, this 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 change represents a, a, a change in funding source. So let Bob talk about that. Money. So, uh, Bob, could you just talk a little bit about what coaching do, how we, how we use them, both out and the literacy. Sure. So the math coach will go into a classroom um, and we'll invite a teacher to work with him and go in on those, observe that teacher, look at the instructional practices, ensure that that teacher is hitting the specific standards for that grade level, approaching strategies and skills in a certain way, making sure that all the content is addressed. It, that person becomes a confidant to the teacher. They're not reporting to the principal. They're not in, the, in a supervisory position. They're really trying to build a capacity for better teaching in the classrooms. That person might work um, also to provide professional development to groups of teachers. Um, and generally, between the two schools, that person's pretty busy 
So the, the, the cost is a decrease at Berwick because the position uh, last year it was approved mid you know mid year, some for a point during the year. The um, the nineteen thousand dollar decrease at Berwick represents um, a shift at half of that math coach uh, from Berlin to Boylston in the budget, since it's being budgeted for the first time in FY twenty three. Uh, it also represents some tutor support to the math coach. Previously, the math coach was a specialist that provided direct services to students. Um, while they're coaching uh, teachers, uh, the tutors will provide direct uh, supports, direct services to students who have those uh, those needs. So, um, the forty-eight thousand represents mostly the uh, a shift of the costs and um, and adding the tutors uh, into both schools. Although we had uh, that partially uh, budgeted previously. So, all, all in all, it's. Um, Know, across the three, you know, that there's a total for each school. Um, you know, again, Jeff mentioned this is, um, you know, we're going to continue to look at this, but this is where we are at, at, at first look. Um, you know, we have a requirement to present our budget in December. Um, there's still uh, things that are estimates and in, in, in relatively hard to determine at this point. We don't know what our state aid is. Uh, when we do our presentation in February, we'll have that information and we'll refine these figures. Um, so a total increase of 7.3% uh, level service. Next, I think uh, we're going to go over the... Um, oh, I just want to say on this uh, spread reserve, that was a vote by the uh, School Committee vote to develop that reserve. And, um, and it was done so that as we build that reserve, we don't, we don't see these as big hits when we get these um, the special education costs that, that are unanticipated. So, and again, I think that was voted last year. No, you right. saw that. Yeah, the, 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 was, the fund was approved two or three years ago. It's the first year we last year. This year is the first year we were able to fund it. Um, and there's $50,000 in the fund. Um, we're going to go through the level service uh, increases next. Um, oh, what? Above uh, level service, excuse me. Um, oh. Somebody can address the teacher and the aides. Yeah, so uh, the first request, uh, above level service request, was the, um, the teacher from Boylston. Um, we have in grade five, we have 34 students leaving this year. Um, the census says that we should have around 43 coming in. NASDAQ predicts or predicts 53 students coming in next year. Uh, NASDAQ has been the NASDAQ project, projections that we've used for our enrollment have been um, either accurate or slightly below. So this year we have 267 students and, and uh, BES and NASDAQ projections. In 2019, with 266 for this year, so about 10 under what actually showed up. The, project, the early projections for the next year at BES total was 308. Um, so you can see that we have 276 now at the, at the NESDAQ project projection. So, so the income and class is correct. That would put us about 300. Um, and so, you know, we'll be within eight to 10 students. Um, and again, so an additional teacher um, will be needed at some point in order to keep those numbers down. I do want to remind you that and when I took this job, you know, they, there was a survey in the community and both the first and second item on what they want to see from the new superintendent uh, is to keep the classroom numbers down. So uh, we think we've been able to do that, but uh, as, as the enrollment begins to increase, and we don't see any drop in that, um, then, then we'll, we'll need more, more teachers. Um, the aids, uh, it should be pointed out, and it's on number two, there's a, actually a little graph there. Between 2014 and 2017, every paraprofessional, general paraprofessional in that school was cut. 
And I was going to be <coughs> sure. I don't know totally, but on the projection, there was a slight downward flip, which really never happened um, in enrollment. And so those, those kind of professionals were born. The kind of professionals were side by side with the teachers, offering direct support to our students, um, social, emotional, academic. Um, and what uh, BES is requesting is 2.45 um, pairs to be added. Um, that still doesn't bring us up to, you know, you, you, when you think about us, 2021, we're still not even at pre-2015 levels at that school with an increased population. So, Bob, you want to talk about the money box? Yeah, so the uh, the teacher um, is 88,000, that represents a 2% base, that's um, for a master's five plus benefits uh, assumption. Uh, the kindergarten aids is intentionally 0.45 so that we can avoid uh, doubling the cost by adding benefits in. Um, so uh, that's 23,000. Um, and um, I also wanted to just say that the, the write-ups, there's detailed write-ups um, that were given by the administrators and the principals that, that talk about you know why these are important. Um, so we're verbally sharing it now, but you can look at that on your own too. I know that there's um, you know the potential if we don't add that teacher, be potentially impacting uh, classrooms uh, at the elementary school. We might have to consider other grades going from, from three to two classes. So I just encourage people to we'll post this to to read it and. Um, it's easier to take that away than our typical PowerPoint presentation where you hear things and you don't necessarily, it's hard to remember. Um, so that's what those two are. Um, and uh, Karen, you over the next uh, sure. So um, the speech language pathologist is at Boylston. Last year we started having more need for speech language pathology than we had. Several years ago, our full-time speech pathologist at Boylston was cut to 0.8 as a budget cut for uh, money saving. And by the end of last year, we just couldn't cover services and we were, were scrapping to find a way to do it. So this year we put in uh, the rest of that time to make, bring her back to full-time into our, our, my special aid grant and we've been paying for it that way. It's not kind of a long-term plan, but it got us through this year so we could get her back to full-time and get everybody's services covered. Um, so that's why that's in there for this year. The floating nurse, I think we've all heard with the increase in need with our nurses, with the, they're running um, a contract tracing out of their offices on top of what they've done all this time. And on top of that, they have um, the test and stay program that they're managing. They're not doing the actual testing finally. We have people in place to do that. But they still have to do some of that testing and they have to manage it and they have to know who's testing and they have to pull those students down. So they've really just tripled their jobs these years. So what we're asking for is to make um, the floating nurse that we have that's a temporary position this year that we have a temp service doing um, full time to support all three buildings. So when there's a need in one particular building, when something's heavy duty and they need extra contract tracers, they can go to that building. If we don't have a substitute for a day, we can use our person to cover the building um, and just to provide a higher level of safety for our students in the buildings. And the last one is the special ed teacher at Boylston. Boylston has um, <coughs> a lower amount of teachers in comparison to the other schools. Um, for instance, at middle school, I know there's one special ed teacher at each grade level. The teacher is part of that grade level. They have time to consult with the teachers. They have time to follow up with parents and families. At Boylston, they have one teacher per three grade levels. And so they're really struggling to do anything other than what they have to do in the IEPs. And they really want to be able to do a better job of being proactive, of working with families, and doing some investigation. And um, so that's why we're asking for another position there. Is that it? Want me to stop there, Bob? There's a BES preschool one a couple down. Want me to do that one too? Sure. So this one is starting to sound like a broken record, I'm afraid, but um, Ace and I always would, we would very much like to see the BES preschool go back to BES. 
It's been not one of our highest priorities in the last few years, but we think it's really important for the students to have access to speech and language pathologists, not just for the half hour that they run from the ES over here to do the services for the student, but to have the speech and language pathologist in the building able to consult with their teachers and work with them throughout the day and see what's happening. And the same with OT and PT. Um, it's difficult. There's wonderful things about the preschool here, but it's difficult for some of those students to get the full service that they could get if they were in the ES. As well as there are some students we would like to be able to have go into the kindergarten and do a little bit of time in the kindergarten. That might be good for them while they're still in preschool, uh, but we don't have that option here. So we would love to see it go back to BES at some point. So I'll, I'll just talk about the costs on those. Um, and I think also that um, when Cameron first we're going back to BES, I think that um, you know what we're representing here is it being added at BES and the Tonto program being maintained. The Tonto program is a uh, is also a vocational train early childhood education training program. Um, but our, our heavy needs special ed students would, would move to BES uh, with the teacher. Our assumption that uh, this is we, we'd have some paying students. Um, students with IEPs do not pay or require to provide those services. So we're assuming that paraprofessional would probably be covered by by the revenue we get in the program. So that's eighty eight thousand dollars for the preschool program. Um, it was uh, salary and benefits for that position. Um, the cost of, of the speech language pathologist. The costs are listed here uh, for each of those positions. Um, we, we, we felt like we also look, we make assumptions about what, um, what level of experience we'd hire and, and factor in benefits for those. Um, the speech language pathologist, you know, we'll look at this more. I mean, that might be something we could, again, keep in the grant one more year. Um, one thing we think about though, is that when we, uh, when you, the state has a rule that when you have professional staff in a grant, you pay a 11%, uh, actually 9% tax. So we would sacrifice 9% of whatever we put in there. And it, and it gets um, contributed to uh, MTRS for pension costs. Um, so we want to long-term move it out, but that might be the type of thing that we could push out one more year and leave it in the grant. Um, so those are the expenses associated with those items. The uh, curriculum assistant, it's right in the middle there. Um, this is this is an assistant for our assistant superintendent. Uh, currently, it's a part-time position. You know, aside from everything we do, it can be boiled down to we're in the business of teaching and learning, and everything, everything related, everything related to teaching and learning in this district is overseen by Kara, as assistant superintendent, um, and it's not as much of a sit behind the desk position as you would think. Matter of fact, we want to we want to in the buildings working directly with uh, teacher groups, working directly with principals, and working on everything related to teaching and learning. And currently, um, for the top part-time position, she's not able to do that. She's in in the office way too much, for her. and um, so we and really what she needs to be able to do is hand off four or five of the day to an assistant and say, I'll be back at three o'clock. This is what I need done. And in the schools and work with principals and work with the teachers um, so that they can have a great impact on students. Um, so that they can, as a group, work and develop professional development that's going to impact students um, in, te in, in their teaching and learning experience. So um, that's the position we think is critical. And Bob, can you talk about the numbers, please? Sure. So the the, 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 the positions, um, the central office, so it's split um, like our central positions, 50%, 25%, 25%, 50 to 25% to each elementary school. Uh, that cost represents uh, a salary of 48000 plus benefits minus what we already have budgeted for the existing part-time role. That, that part-time role would go away and be replaced by this. So that's the, the 50196 This is the, um, um, the total across all three schools. Yeah. I was thinking all this time I thought you loved having me in the office. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of absorbed that. The next position is the elementary uh, 
literacy coach, similar to the MAP coach coordinator. And the, the, the timing on this is, is significant in that there's a, a tremendous shift in uh, the teaching of literacy, particularly at the early grades. Um, we're doing the science of literacy. Um, you'll see, uh, we talked about this at one of the other meetings with foundations and Hegarty, new skills and new strategies for teaching children how to learn to read um, and to write and to communicate. Um, so with that, we need somebody who has the expertise in that area and can work with the teachers, support them as they're shifting instructional practices um, and they're really learning as they're teaching the students. We also have in three through five uh, teachers who are moving into a new uh, curriculum resource, but they have to have training on that and, and continuous training, continuous work in those areas, staying up with them, looking at assessments, looking at that data, um, and being able to take that data and put into action some of the um, intervention steps that, that we need to have in place for our children. Learning to read. This is like the, of everything. If our children don't know how to read, they can't do anything else. It is the most critical um, academic area that we need to focus on. So we're looking for that position to fulfill that role, uh, to do professional development, to do training, to work with the teachers, to work with the principals across both elementary schools. And also to provide, also to provide uh, as a liaison to, again, to the parent community and helping parents learn how to teach their children at home to support the work that's being done in the schools. Do you want me to do that one next? The, the instrument, instruments? Yeah. Yeah. So this, you know, in our district improvement plan, we focus on the music department in one of our sections of teaching and learning. And this area was brought to, to my attention um, by, the, by the music department. Um, what we're trying to do is build, you know, we talk about equity, build equitable opportunities for all of our students to be able to play instruments. Students who love music but may not be able to be afforded the opportunity because of the cost. We have students who obviously rent their instruments, but there are children who cannot afford to purchase or to rent those instruments as well. We have instruments in the school, but what the music department brought to my attention is these instruments have been here a long time, both in the elementary schools, middle and high school. They either need to be replaced or refurbished at this point. So what we tried to do is make a reasonable, they set up a, a chart with me and they made a reasonable amount of um, suggestions for instruments, specific instruments to be replaced over several years of time. So that's what those numbers represent for this year. And we tried to do that similar to what we do with the curriculum, um, the content area, um, resources that we purchase to do this over, uh, use a cycle. We have a cycle of replacement or refurbishing. So that's what this represents. So the, the cost for the LA position, again, this is with benefits included, is 105000 The instrument repairs is 12000 um, We also might have ways to, to look at potentially paying for some of this out of, we have, I think, a donation fund. And uh, if we had some, we do have a small amount budgeted for repairs in the budget right now. So there's things we can look at for some of these. But, um, you know, again, to Carol's point about equity, we do want to have kind of a, the ability to kind of maintain these instruments and kind of recycle or refurbish some uh, annually each year. Um, but again, we are going to look at uh, that further. Um, the single sign-on softwares, uh, we have a, a million. Um, I'm not the expert on this, but I know it's explained to me that we have a, a million different passwords and logons that we create. and. Um, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a this is a program that would enable us to sign in. I think using our Google um, name and password, and uh, it would also kind of tie in with our desire to be secure um, and not have people keeping track of their names and passwords in places that that they shouldn't. Yeah, it actually allows kids to just take a QR code instead. They don't have to remember anything. Yeah, they literally just get their own code on the screen and, and shoot them. Um, and that's 6,000, it's 2,000 per each school. Um, school choice, this is something we'll talk more about um, at our next meeting. Um, 
in January, but this is, this is, we have healthy reserves of school choice. The district receives $5,000 for every student the district takes in from another town. Um, in addition, we receive an increment for special education costs, depending on, um, I don't know exactly how it's determined, but it's based on um, covering some of those uh, incremental costs for special ed students that come into the district. Um, the, um, the amount we've, so let's, uh, using rough numbers, uh, I don't have the exact numbers off the head, but for illustrative purposes, we take in about uh, 500,000 a year in school choice money. Right now we budget to spend uh, a little bit over 700,000, uh, between seven and 800,000. So we are uh, budgeting to basically erode our reserves. Now we can afford to do this right now because we have healthy reserves, but at some point we need to reduce that gap and basically we should be spending uh, the revenue that we take in. Um, so this represents what I think would be a kind of a healthy step towards reducing the gap However, when we come to kind of reviewing these, that's one I would sacrifice early on, given the, um, the large um, increases that we're seeing overall. So, um, but I didn't want to put it there. It's in our district improvement plan. It's something we think we need to address. Um, and, um, and it would be 115,000. Um, we also didn't take in um, school choice students in Boston last year. So part of this, <coughs> Also, it's kind of a reminder to us uh, in the schools, um, you know, we are gonna create uh, some budget challenges um, if we don't accept school choice students, but continue to rely on this funding. Uh, there's kind of a balance there. Um, so that's something that, uh, that we try to look at. The last item is the Tahanto Counseling Department uh, and Tahanto STEM teacher. First, I should also say, because Diane's not here, she asked, Bob, why, why am I last? Why am I two items last? Um, these are not in any priority order. These are um, listed, they're all here. They have not been prioritized yet. Um, so I wanted to, to clarify that. And Jeff, you gonna talk about the last two? Yeah. Um, so when I took the job here, one of the things, I, I think it came from a old friend, Jim Spencer. One of the first things he said to me was, we lose kids out of school, so I want you to find out why, and then I want you to do something about it, and find a way that we can separate ourselves from other schools. A lot of high performing schools in the area. So one of the things we've been working on is the, um, the development of an internship shadowing um, experience for our juniors and seniors to allow them in the junior and senior year to leave the building for some part of the, of the time and, um, uh, and, and visit, have shadowing internship experience at um, various uh, technology companies in the area. Uh, we have someone this year was working on a database of those companies who would um, accept students from us. Um, at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, COVID comes along and we see uh, just a, an explosion of, of anxiety and depression in students and things that we really need to deal with. Uh, so this gave us an opportunity to expand the, uh, the counseling department. We currently have um, we currently have two guidance counselors for seven grades. Uh, so what we are what we're proposing here is the addition of one more guidance counselor, uh, so that we could have one dedicated to grades six to eight, and deal with because that's what we're seeing a lot of the social emotional issues in those grades, um, and especially the transition from elementary to middle school. Um, one counselor for grades uh, nine and 10, and then one for uh, 11 and 12, that would also pick up the internship shadowing job. So the, the career the career um, counseling piece. So that's that's the addition of one guiding, one FTE guidance counselor to the hospital. And then the other thing is we have we have, I think it's roughly 10 teachers who teach outside the contract, uh, who teach six courses instead of five. It severely limits the, um, the expansion of our programming in the district uh, and it's a structural deficit. We really do need to do something about uh, that we need to ship away with. Um, adding a one FTP STEM teacher 
this is really a two for one. Adding uh, one STEM teacher, to, and then it allows us to take our uh, athletic director, who, who, who actually teaches three math courses, uh, remove all his teaching, uh, all his teaching roles, and um, it would be a full-time AD and then uh, an additional full-time STEM teacher. But the other, the other, the other great thing about this is that. We want to expand the role of the athletic director. We want the athletic director, as you know, coaches, athletic directors, we have a lot of kids who play sports, have a big impact on children. So we want the AD to start offering workshops to students, workshops on leadership, workshops on fair play, collegiality, all of these things um, that are important for their emotional growth. Uh, so. That one's really a two for one. Bob, you want to take a look at that? So the, the cost of this uh, two positions are 88000 change and one five. This um, We made an assumption that we want to find somebody ideally with uh, multiple licenses so they can teach, in, uh, for example, engineering and math classes. Uh, so we assumed uh, a little bit more of an advanced um, placement on our, on our salary schedule than some of the other positions. And so, um, in total, that would bring uh, the above level service request to 4.9 percent or 880,000 relative to last year's budget. Uh, if you know, if everything was funded, you know, dream world obviously, uh, but you know, if everything was funded, we'd be looking at a 12.2 uh, percent increase, and those are the increases by schools. Um, but again, we thought it was important to outline uh, what these things are and why we want to do them um, and, and get feedback and um, certainly get feedback from the towns as well. Uh, and then we have some time between now. Uh, we will actually be meeting with um, it's both the towns before the, the open uh, budget hearing. Um, and we'll continue to, to look at this, make uh, revisions and, and prioritize. Bob, can you just cover the uh, for people with expenses the slide and then the timeline and then we can go to the questions. So um, the districts on this slide, uh, if you uh, go on the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed's website, I believe this is the DART uh, tool. Uh, these are the districts it, it calls as uh, it, it identifies as peer districts or comparable districts. Um, they're not exactly the same. They're between a thousand and two thousand. I think between a thousand and twenty one hundred students. Um, similar demographics for the most part. And I'm familiar with some of these towns. Um, Mount Greylock uh, is probably the <coughs> closest in size. So this shows you uh, what our per pupil spending is relative to other districts. And it is a little bit different by school as well. We don't have, um, through the information provided uh, by the state, it doesn't have a school level breakout, but we know from when we were um, prior to regionalizing the elementary schools that Berlin would have been uh, higher than the highest there, Berlin Memorial, in part because your fixed costs of the building, including the administration, all the maintenance costs, um, are spread over a smaller number of students. If you look at just the instructional piece, it would actually be pretty comparable to, to Boylston. Boylston previously was in the bottom 7% of the state, Boylston Elementary. Um, and I think uh, we saw that right at the end of when we were regionalizing, they were up to uh, somewhere in the, the 20s, high 20s. Uh, so we made some progress there. And Tahanto was slightly below the median in the state. So this shows where we are. Uh, it, we are. Um, Below the uh, the state median, um, and we'll uh, we'll share this again next meeting. I'll probably add a, a state median, which I should have included there. Um, I thought that was helpful to put give you some context uh, about uh, our budget. Um, and with a thousand students, um, you know, to, if we looked at kind of the middle. I don't know, Seacon, which is uh, about half a million dollars, half a hundred to five hundred thousand dollars more than here. 500,000 times 1,000 students, 500 students, excuse me, 500 dollars times 1,000 students is about 500,000 dollars. So to get to the, the meeting of this group, we have a have to increase our budget by 500,000. So that's just some context uh, for where we are. 
It's also important to point out Mount Gorilla is probably the most like us about a new agreement. It was based on the original agreement. So um, we looked at this. Yeah. I have a question about that. Does this include regional transportation or transportation costs in the per pupil, in the per pupil costs? Because I'm I'm thinking that you know some of these districts have much um, wider geographic areas, and so transportation costs would be higher and things like that. I just didn't know if if it includes that or not. I I can check that. I I know that net school spending, which is a different number, does not include it. I. I'm not 100% certain if per pupil expenditures includes it or not. I don't think it does. Um, but I'll confirm and get back to you via email. Okay, um, just curious. Thank I, you. I do know that Millis, Seekonk, uh, I live in Millis, Littleton are similar to our towns where it's within town. Um, so the transportation will be similar. Uh, Medway, uh, Mount Greylock might be different. Uh, Manchester Essex might be different. <clears throat> The, uh, the next slide is just a, uh, showing what upcoming dates we have um, related to the budget and significant events. I, I want to point out in January, um, you know, I, one of the things I did was check with other districts on the timing of their budget presentation. Um, we don't get, uh, we receive Chapter 70 revenue information uh, in January from the state. That's when they release it. Uh, that has a significant impact on the assessments uh, that the towns get. Um, Berlin pays for the Berlin Memorial School. Boylston pays for the Boylston Elementary School. Tahanto is split, and there are minimum contributions that are defined for municipalities uh, by DESI based on your wealth, uh, based on the number of students uh, in your district. Um, all of these uh, have significant impacts on the budget. Not necessarily the spending. Uh, this is the only one that's spending related. We don't have a lot of optics to which of our to to people in our towns uh, that are going to uh, choice and charter. Um, so we get updates on that in January. Um, we know the students that are coming in, but not as much about the students that have gone out. We could have somebody move into town. And can you continue to go to another? Uh, continue to go to where they were. We have to pay as a school choice uh, sending district. So that's a significant expense we find that about. Uh, in the revenue we get from Chapter 71 and Chapter 70, 71 is transportation. Those are significant inputs as well. We have heard that um, the revenue picture is a little bit better um, at the state level, but um, whether that translates to anything, uh, we'll see. Um, it's, there's uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but the Chapter 70 formula is pretty complicated. and. Um, it's set up in a way that doesn't penalize you if you, um, I'm gonna not go into it, but basically we're getting minimum, minimal increases each of the last five uh, to six years. Um, with the Student Opportunity Act, for changing the funding for Chapter 70 in the foundation budget. And uh, there's a chance that it could result in us getting more Chapter 70 revenue. Um, so we'll, we'll see, uh, that certainly would help. Um, <coughs> The towns have been taking, uh, most of our increases are coming in the form of assessments, not Chapter 78. So this is a potential opportunity that we uh, could see in the budget process. Um, the open public budget hearing is in mid-February, um, and this will allow, the time between this and the March 8th meeting will allow time for uh, comments, feedback, and for the district to kind of absorb that information. And um, we'll either present the same budget in February 15th or take uh, feedback into uh, consideration and potentially make an adjustment for the March 8th meeting. Um, <clears throat> so I know one of the questions was, is this the, the, the final budget that we're going to get? Um, not necessarily. Um, I think we um, we're going to look for feedback we get from the towns between now and February uh, and try to um, work towards a, a place that we think um, balances what the town's uh, feedback is and balances what the school's needs are. But again, we do have the opportunity to make adjustments here. And the town meetings are, are these two dates are, are at the bottom. 
It can't be. We would be not negotiating good faith if we um, did go into negotiations and kind of um, we have to negotiate the contract. So we, we can just make an estimate uh, unless we actually have to sign the contract, um, the number that's in our budget's an estimate and subject to change. This happens every three years. It's typically a three year contract. Um, once we have this one done, it will be easy to budget the next two years. It's a challenge right. this year. Um, we budgeted what we what is typical, which is two percent. It could be higher, it could be lower. I, um, and um, when we talk about risks and opportunities in January, we'll talk about that. I can share like what is the impact of an additional one percent. Um, but no, that's a good question, and uh, you know the timing is such that it is, has to be an estimate um, for the February March presentation. Yeah, it's a three-year contract, so we can get close to the estimate for this budget. And the budget that we have the next budget, it will be. It will be. So, so we'll have an idea of the number by February, March. Yeah, well, you know, we go into the negotiation of, well, you know, we go into the negotiation of knowing what our estimate is, so that, that, that helps. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? <coughs> So, um, Howard Program, Poison and Finance. So, my, check, my uh, comment to you here is the above level service request. Can you clarify in all future documentation whether that's a one time charge or an ongoing charge? So, in other words, let's say you pick one of these things up, let's use single sign on. I assume that's an annual cost for the license. So, if you're going to do this, you're going to be continuing to do this year over year. It'd be nice to know here which of these are going to be single hit to the budget. Added on, or this has now become a fixed expense going forward. I assume when you're hiring teachers and other things, you're not going to fire them the next year. You're going to continue yeah. this. I just hope not. Yeah. I, I can address that. I, I, in my, I, I talked to the principals about this. Anything that's one time, I try not to budget. Um, so, um, well, let's use the musical instruments. I heard it may be a three to five year program that you're going to upgrade and then it would drop off. Yep. That's, that's, good, that's good. good information would be very useful. Yep, that's a good question on that one. We have to look at more, Howard. Um, I, you know, we, we will have to look at that more. If, there, if it turns out that there's an element to that that's one time, um, I mean, there's a number of instruments and they want to repair some. Um, there might be a certain number they repair every year. A specific a single instrument is actually more expensive than I realized. Um, so we would, when we budget this, want to budget just the recurring costs. Okay. Thank you. Well, any other questions? I'm just full of questions. So my question is on a, cu a couple of the positions. COVID has clearly had an impact, and I and I feel for the schools, and, and you know we in frontline service have have um, really borne the brunt um, of, of COVID and um, trying to work with that. So you mentioned COVID um, with respect to the floating nurse and COVID was also mentioned as part of the um, addition to the Tejando Counseling Department. Are you, uh, I, and I know the state just passed legislation yesterday um, for COVID funding, broad COVID funding. Are you aware of any funding in that package that could potentially provide seed funding or, um, or or some future funding for these positions? Not yet. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking into that. I mean, one of the things, so we don't know in terms of test. Let's just take the nurse, for example. We don't know in terms of testing what it's going to be like next year. We don't know if the test is still going to be required. And if we had, so currently we have our nurses and then we have, um, do, do, um, 
through the Department of Ed, we have a company that provides um, a healthcare professional that helps our nurses with the testing. It takes an enormous amount of time to do that testing. So we have some someone that does that, and that's, that's not a cost to us that's provided to the state. Um, if we didn't have that, the nurses would have to do all of that. We don't know if, we're, if the state's going to have that contract. So we're, we're waiting to see on some of this to see. So if, they, if we did have that contract with CIC next year, um, maybe we could get away without that nurse. So, but we don't know that. Um, again, we have superintendents have meetings with the commission every week or two, and you know these are the kind of updates we get. So as soon as we know if we have that contract, we'll know if we have um, additional money, or if we have additional grant money for um, the uh, the counseling department to deal with the social emotional stuff. But our plan was to expand the guidance department. And all of these problems that we're seeing, we just see more of them. It's not like we didn't see them before. Um, so, and, and then we wanted to expand that position of the internship shadow, shadowing person. Again, we're working on a database this year, hoping to have that position put in. So, um, these were things that we were. A lot of them they were in the pipelines we were working on. This is just pushing stuff to the forefront. So anything that has to do with social and emotional learning or anxiety or any of that kind of stuff, it's sort of got pushed up a notch just because we need to deal with it. You know. So, but we'll keep you posted on um, you know additional funding as it comes in. I know I look for Bob, Carol, so we will we'll continue to do that. Margaret, did you have more questions on your list? I'm all, I'm all set, thank you. Okay. We're going to see you tomorrow, Margaret. So. Yes, you, yes. yes, that's right. That's I'll right. add some tomorrow. Last call for questions? Oh. Just regarding the nurse, when we had that conversation, it was a very specific conversation about the ending at the end of the week. So that now become just part of the regular budget process. We're going to have to hold the nurse going on, or does that go not matter, or, or how does it work? Well, originally, what we were budgeting this for was just for um, one year to have the full universe this year and then because of the uncertainty next year. So um, that would, my guess, that would be an option for the committee to either, we either put it in, we didn't make a decision that we would put this in full time as a fourth nurse or um, a fourth nurse or to do another um, floating nurse for a year. The problem is, the problem becomes, um, and either of those would sort of work at, at this at this moment. The problem becomes, in order to get a floor to this, we really have to go through a contracting agency. Because um, people aren't going to take a nurse who can get a job anyway now, isn't going to want to take one for a year. So if you go through a contract, you end up paying more. So it's a $70,000 position now. Um, and they're not even your nurse, really. They're just, you know, they're, they're high at hand. Um, we, we invested in one, we'd get a loaded nurse. Um, cost uh, would be a lot less. Of course, you're doing it every year. So uh, that's that's something we're going to need to consider. Yeah, I just remember, uh, maybe it was like two months ago. The question was if we need one, can the nurse attend it? So I was just surprised to see that. I think I saw an email from you earlier, too, which I was surprised to see that. Yeah. Um, my next question is more, you touched on it in a few slides. Is there going to be a, maybe in the next presentation, uh, more of a presentation as to, you know, you see a voter said or a taxpayer sees 12%. So what the hell are you going to do with 12%? You see, you know, 30, 40, in some cases 70% in a lot of categories on those tests. And I know, you know, we've talked a lot of stock in last year's NCAS tests, but still, in some cases, 70% of kids weren't even meeting expectations. And now we have a 12% increase. Are we going to specifically tell them how that's going to improve that? But in terms of numbers on tests? Just an improvement overall. I know we don't put a lot of stock in our tests, but they are something we have to do. Yeah, I mean, we make projections and so only the principals, I and mean, we're actually going to speak to it tonight. Um, you know, the, the coaching roles have had a major impact. Uh, yeah, they've had a major impact uh, on, on, on uh, especially the math um, now that they shared between the buildings. I know the principals have seen the impact. 
um, you know, if you ask it for a quantitative, like you know, you put a coach in, how much does that increase the numbers? I mean, that's that's yeah, going to be a little more. That's going to be a little more difficult there. But you know, in terms of what you get for percentage, you know, a lot of it's tough to quantify. I mean, you know, you get ten percent, and you get a kid who's, um, you know. Counseling, they're not cutting, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. Is it worth it? You know, and those are the things they have to consider because those a lot of those things are what we're dealing with now. Just you know, a lot of the social emotional issues that have just been you know brought to the well, yeah, and we have a huge increase in employment, and then we still see 70% of kids aren't even meeting expectations on these tests, and then money's not the well. Well, I think I think you have to wait till we actually have an M test that's. Done okay. you know, so it's not. It's a valid. It's a valid question. I just think that's a, such a shocking number. Well, yeah. yeah. No, I, I get right. that. What, what do I get? For? And, and we understand we got to put numbers up on the board, the board, but it's more than just academic stuff. It's a, you know, as a parent, you would know that. Mm -hmm. You know that it's not just that. It's all of these things that you think. Yeah, I like a lot of the things that you say here. The eighty going full time and holding leadership conferences for workshops. I never imagined that. I never had that in my life. I think that's a great idea. Well, you missed so, out. Should have went to our school. I absolutely did. That's yes, for you. Um, but I like that. Like, but things like that. Are you going to do in a future presentation to highlight all these things? This is what we're doing. We're not going to say we're going to go from seventy percent to forty percent, not me, but we're expecting significant improvement in this, that, that. Just these are the numbers. Okay, we're going to hire this teacher, that teacher, this role. It's going to cost this much. Yeah, that, that's fine. You can imagine you put another teacher in there, do a small class, and it's better. Yeah. What does that actually see? Are you going to actually tell us when we, when we come to vote on such a large number? Are you know, we going to know what we're getting for other than just numbers on paper? Yeah, well, it won't be a, this number. I mean, they won't be. Yes, yeah, I understand it'll be lower. So, but we, we're presenting these other steps. We're trying to say there should be improvement. But for some of these things, and so to answer your question directly, as we start to prioritize these things, We'll start to determine which ones we need to make right now um, and why they are priority, and then we'll be able to give you a little more on them. But you will see these again in the district improvement plan. Some of the stuff we can push off for a year or two years, then, then of course we're going to do it um, and try to spread the cost out. Um, but we try to think about as a district what are the things we're going to need to move uh, to give our students what they need over the next one to three years. So. Yeah, we're going to have to stop prioritizing. Thank you. Okay, so, so on that note, I think we should move on. We're over time. Um, my son is anything pressing we want to go into. Okay, and um, thank you for joining us. We're about to welcome you today. Yeah. You want to listen to more business of this company? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, we'll to you That's an office I've been ruling. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go with the order on my report. Um, the first item, uh, something that uh, is requesting the school committee approve earlier during the business order section of the meeting. Our insurance company has a risk management grant kind of outlined uh, you know, basically the intent uh, of them giving this grant is for us to engage in activities that will re reduce our exposure uh, to a claim. Uh, and they win by not having to pay out for a claim. <coughs> Um, what we have, um, we received the grant, uh, it's $4,919.85. We're going to use it for a cybersecurity risk assessment, uh, just under $4,000, and offer some material handling equipment so we can um, avoid like something on the back injury or you know, more for, for occupational safety. So that's what that is. Um, this is an annual grant that we can apply for. Um, Cybersecurity risk assessment through the third party vendor. This is something that our is recommended. Um, and we're able to uh, get it uh, paid for uh, through this grant. 
The second uh, item that I want to go over is the uh, Summer Programming Reimbursement Grant. Uh, Margaret earlier asked a question about grants. Um, this is something that just cropped up. We weren't um, expecting it. Um, and um, I think Carol and Karen and Jeff and I occasionally uh, have had some surprises this year with some grants, some of them small, but this one's for 15000 um, And uh, we ran a, if I remember, we ran a summer acceleration academy uh, this summer. Uh, we had a good response. We actually, uh, to the program, had one more class than we expected. So we are um, getting reimbursed for the of that program. We're also getting, uh, this, this will cover some of the costs of our summer special ed program. Uh, we saw a uh, large increase uh, in the number of students participating in that program from 34 in 2019 to 54 in 2021. Some of those were for compensatory services. Uh, so a portion of those uh, additional costs can be recovered. This money will go back um, into the general fund for the, uh, a couple of these were charged through grant. This will kind of free up some money uh, to pay for some other things. And again, I would recommend, uh, we recommend that you accept this grant uh, for us. Um, the financial statements, uh, Powers and Sullivan are our CPA firm. Uh, they have completed um, their audit and um, kind of uh, shared um, audit financials and a management letter comment. Um, two items on the management letter comment, one is uh, for a fraud, um, is for an internal control review. Um, I will be doing that. Um, they've given me kind of a, a model uh, to, to follow, um, basically to assess risk of um, theft or fraud or things like that. Um, so that's something that we can complete on our own. The other recommendation to have is for the cybersecurity uh, assessment, which uh, we're going to engage a third party for who uh, specializes in that. Um, I talked to Susan. We had a lot on the agenda for tonight, and uh, we decided that um, we want to have uh, the audit firm in. Uh, we haven't done this uh, previously. It wasn't uh, in interest of the uh, committee before. It's, um, Cox and Sullivan goes to most of their clients 2% once a year, just so you know that it's a real person, it's a real audit. Um, that the business office didn't uh, make this up themselves. Um, so it is something that I would recommend that you do. Um, and we would schedule it sometime in March, <coughs> excuse me, and probably include um, somebody to talk about both at, at the same time, which is a significant <coughs> item in the financial statements. Um, these are not really how we run the district. These are required reports um, in GAP format and or in modified uh, accrual uh, format. Um, government financials can be a little bit um, confusing. Um, so um, if anybody has questions, I, I, I would request that we wait, uh, wait for a presentation from the auditors in the spring. <coughs> Excuse me. The last item is deferred um, Berlin Memorial Lease Agreement. We have uh, more discussions with the town, so we have a draft, but it's not yet uh, ready to be finalized. And this is for the lease of the Berlin Memorial Elementary Building for a dollar. It's something that we're supposed to have. Um, and uh, we just want to, once we have this in place, we'll just roll it over year after year. We'll probably share it with Boston if there's anything from Boston Elementary, so we don't have any desire to, to change it. Um, so once we have those finalized, we'll bring it back to the committee to, to review. Any questions for Bob? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, this is for Bob. I'm bringing forward this evening the ESSER 3 grant for the approval of the school committee, similar to what we've done did in the fall with our other grants from federal and state uh, levels. This ESSER 3 grant just uh, we received approval on after that meeting, so I wanted to make sure that um, you had a chance to see that. This particular grant was $268,868. Uh, and unlike uh, the other ESSER grants, and, and Typical grants, even the, even the federal grants, this one was a very transparent, very public grant. We were required to get input from the community, both the school community and the parent and uh, 
parent and community at large, um, which we're able to do through the survey that we provided to parents and the community. Um, we also, we took feedback from there. I know that um, we met with CPAC, we spoke with the PTOs, uh, principals and Karen and met with the PTOs and their staff as well to get a, uh, an idea of what the priorities were for the schools. Um, we then moved into prioritizing that funding. Some of what you'll see here will be funding over a two-year period of time. The grant ends uh, September, the end of September 2024. So we're spending down our SRO um, two grants right now, and we'll move into this grant at the beginning of next year with, with um, these costs. Again, we make sure made sure that we, we maintain that elementary adjustment council for two more years. Um, that was critical. Some tutoring work. Um, we also want to try to run that summer learning academy again as the second year. Um, um, and also the family success partnership with wraparound services that we have about, available for families as well. So those are just some of the costs of this, of this particular grant. Questions? Comments? Thanks, Carol. <coughs> Karen, get your voice back. I'll try. Um, so last at our last school committee meeting, the, the committee asked that we compile our vaccination numbers as best we could. So in the beginning of my report, I gave you a little background about how this is done. It's not an easy process, and they really have to pull them student by student and staff by staff. And some people have not shared that information, so they might be able to pull it. Um, and I just wanted you to know that process so you know it's not a real-time kind of thing at this point. We're investing in some software that we're hoping that we'll be able to change our medical records in a way that will make it a little bit easier to pull some of this data, um, but not as instantaneous as we would like. Um, so I just wanted to read for you the, the results. Boylston Elementary, we had 92 st students and staff had completed both doses. Maybe 131 more, 131 more to reach that 80%. For other memorial, we had 13% of students and 90% of staff were fully vaccinated. And Tahanto, we had 445 out of 662 student, staff and students. So they were at 70%. They're our highest at this point. Um, Pre-K does get included in that number, but it wasn't making a significant difference. We, um, as you know, I think we had the vaccination clinic here over the weekend, much better turnout this um, time. We had, I think I reported 91 signed up but when I was here Saturday morning and we were up to 131. I didn't get a final out from them yet, but we had a pretty good turnout and then they'll be back in three weeks to do the follow-up doses. And they were taking all ages? All ages. We get parents vaccinated, it helps the kids as much as getting the kids vaccinated. So, happy to take anybody. And, and Karen, do you have an idea of that timeline on when that vaccination data might be ready? When the what? When the vax data might be ready to include in the COVID dashboard. The data from this? Uh, the, uh, the vaccination rates at each school. So that's where I'm, I guess that's what I'm saying. We can't pull that in real time. It's very staff intensive to do that. Right. You can't go in and pull it. Once we get the new software, it'll be easier, but it still won't be uh, quite as, as simple. Um, and that's going to be sometime in January before we get the new software. Okay. So that's going to be your way. Um, Adam? But it's being presented here. You're, you're saying that right now with Tonto, as of when you told it, December 9th. Yep. 67% were fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have a school by school here as a, a particular date that they have been. Yeah, I was just wondering in terms of uh, officially being able to put it in the uh, dashboard and having updates and that kind of Updating is going to be the hard part. You could do um, a one time information, but. Um, and maybe once we get the new software, we'll be able to give it to you a little more often. Yeah, and maybe it's something like maybe the vaccine 
and then, well, that's a discussion of the COVID dashboard, but maybe the VAX data is updated on the dashboard at a different rate than the uh, COVID data. Um, uh, I'm gonna yeah, and that would make a lot of sense, and I, I can appreciate the time you guys took to give us this snapshot in time, and I, I certainly don't, in my opinion, think it's necessary to see a daily or weekly update of this information. Uh, one question I, I do have looking at the Tejano number, maybe we don't know it, but if we do, or do we have a sense as to how many of the unvaccinated in these numbers were partially vaccinated, and we're just waiting for them to get their second dose? Because I'm sure the sixth graders in particular, they don't quite have the time to have, have both doses and then have the two weeks after. I assume that part of the reason the number is what it is. Right, and I, I don't know what that number is. Laura, yeah. Yeah, how long? I, it's going to be really labor intensive because if you're taking, you're loading everything in, and it, it'll be so great when it's done. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, and there's no, I mean, I know there's no um, expectation when I ask this question, but just to kind of give everybody an idea, how long is it going to take to input all of that data into the new system? It, it's, it, a lot of it's done electronically. Mm -hmm. The challenge is getting all of the people to talk together. Paul's been helping me with that. <laughs> And getting all of the in it and the technology pieces will be on me. But once we get it going, we're hoping that the changeover from our old system to our new system will be about a week and then some cleanup time. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, in my discussions with the nurse, the two of them, which are familiar with this all the work, you know, they seem to get the uh, impression I got. There. Once all the data is up, once all of that, then getting these, getting all of these grades is really just a matter of getting what you pull. Just pulling, just pulling that report. So, um, and I want to say that I appreciate that you, people wanted to do this system because I, it, it sounds like it's going to be extremely helpful, oh, especially yeah. over the long term as well. So, thank you. Any other questions from here? I guess my, my only comment would be that, you know, I think my own personal reason for wanting to see these numbers is still close to where 80% are not there. We put them out there, we're probably not going to be there tomorrow next week either. Um, and I think that we'll need to revisit it at an appropriate time when we think we might be there at that point. I think probably this has been helpful. And barring there's no changes coming up, Jesse, in terms of what we're allowing a lot to do as we have the 15th throughout. Thank you. All right. Oh, just a quick question. I'm just wondering um, if this information, the vaccination rates that you just shared with us, might be something that Jeff could put in his um, update because I feel like I'm glad we have the data for our own FYI. Um, and because I think some of the school committee members, when we vote, we need to, you know, we need as much data as we can. But I think there's parents out there that kind of want to know, like, where are we, one way or another, whether or not they want the mask or they don't want the mask. Or they're just wondering, like, what's going on? Are, kids, are other kids getting vaccinated? Um, so I don't know if you're able to. I know there's all kinds of rules with HIPAA and everything, but well, if you're well, able to. Well, that's valid. You just. Friday, you mean the Friday newsletter? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's great. I'm shocked that that many kids from Boyles and Elementary already are vaccinated. That's a, <laughs> that's a great. You know, um, so I mean, I'm just wondering if you could share that. I think that type of communication will give the community, like, a sense, like, yes, we are tracking this. Yes, we do have a sense. Yes, people are getting vaccinated. Yeah, you know, we can put a vaccination update, please. All of this data is not identifying any person, so we're able to do that. Um, okay. It's all it, it's all available, so we can do it as a group and report it that way. Yeah, I think it's worth it. I mean, it's just my opinion, but. Okay. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> so, uh, that's great, Karen. Thank you for all of the work behind that. Yeah. Uh, we don't get to see that we're doing out there every day between the nurses and the, um, this, all this uh, data piece of the vaccination rates. It's complicated and we appreciate all that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, so, I'm going to move over to Paul. It's going to be a five. Time check. Are you doing okay? Sure. Um, good evening. Um, again, my report is pretty brief. Um, I just gave you a few highlights um, about state and federal data. Um, one update since I put this together last week. Um, on Monday, the state um, announced that 
they were going to be pre-populating some of the federal CRDC data. Um, and so they asked us to refrain from inputting data until mid-January, January 18th. Um, so just one additional update um, that didn't have a chance to go into that report, because it happened Monday. Um, I really want to highlight the second piece, um, again, partially because it's on, on your votes for tonight, but um, uh, the district received $47,399.36 um, from the uh, Emergency Connectivity Fund. Um, that will allow us to um, replace 178 Chromebooks. Um, that's the good news. Like, the bad news is we have about 300 to replace, so we still have some work to go, but it does certainly put a big debt in that. Um, and as well as allow us to continue to offer um, internet connectivity to some families that are, are struggling and don't have internet connection at home. So it allows us to um, pay for that monthly hotspot that they're using. Yeah, uh, 473993 yeah, uh, 473993 we'll vote on that. Okay. So we're up to Ace. Good evening, everyone. Um, I was asked, uh, is that on the school improvement plan? It should look very familiar um, because it is the, the district improvement plan brought down to the old world. Yeah, I think it's really important that everyone realizes how much in alignment we try to we try to get across the district. Um, and so to that end, I won't go page by page. I was going to highlight just two two areas that I thought um, bear highlight and bring your attention to goal one um, around curriculum alignment and that second subset around literacy coaches identifying expository writing across content areas K through five. And I think that's. I bring that I bring that to your attention because that was something we talked about when we were reviewing that new half state. We talked a lot about writing and the struggle with writing. Um, what does that look like? It's it's more opportunities in the classroom for kids to book rental day or fingers to to feedback and produce and receive feedback on the work they do. And that's the best way that you can really build up that skill. Um, I also wanted to highlight because you notice that the literacy coaches we currently have in place support that endeavor. Um, and I think that's important to talk, to talk about, I mean, not still talking about the budget, where we're, we're talking about creating a literacy coach position that's going to be able to provide even more focus and attention to this, while also doing all of the other work that we're, we're tapping these folks in for. You know, you, you talked about the, the um, new literacy program we're bringing in K through two, and we're piloting in three through five. And that's a ton of work, and those teachers need a ton of support. And right now, the literacy coaches we have, they don't have full time jobs. So on top of supporting them, there's, you know, Kathy Murphy does the full case load of the intervention, but she's providing for kids too. And so to, to continue this work and to really to, to be able to emphasize that that's something that's, that's in the vision, in the budget, so that we can, we can grow that. Um, the other area I was going to point out was in goal two and in the inclusive practices goal. It's on the second page there all by itself. It's adding that 0.6 um, counselor, the adjustment counselor at DES. Um, and because it, we have noticed uh, the uptick in social emotional needs in the, in the building. And this is an attempt to, to try to support kids through that. Um, what this position is applied allow us to do is support teachers in the tier one implementation of the Chang School community. Um, tier one meaning that whole class is connected. She's able to support the teachers in providing that. Um, and she's also able to take some of that tier two, some of those kids that need a little bit more. Um, so she can take them out, she can push in, and we've had more trouble this year with kids 
struggling to get in the building in the morning, so she's been able to work individually with kids and families to develop plans. What that means for learning is that we're supporting these kids in getting available to learn. And if, they, if we can't get them in the building, if they can't focus on, if they're too busy focusing on that, those hierarchy of needs, you know, they can't be present for learning. And that's what this role really does. It allows kids to be present. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there, but where the time and the fact that you guys have already seen the district improvement plan, I figured I'd talk about those and then just take any questions. Is, as someone who had a student in fifth grade or a child um, who needed help getting into the building, the counselor was invaluable. And once the child was in, it was smooth sailing. So I think it's really wonderful. And with COVID, I think all these kids really want to be home. They're not, they're, they almost, they're becoming homophobic in some ways. And so I, I think that's a great idea. They can get used to being home with their families. And you know, I mean, even some kids are worried about their parents. What are their parents doing without them? They've been, you know, they've been there taking care of their parents for a year. <laughs> what, what are these parents going to do? And I assure them, you know, they can still they can make their own food, okay. Um, but it's a, you know, I, I joke about it, I guess about it, but it's, these are real concerns that kids are, are going through. Um, and it's nice to be able to offer that support to those families. Anyone else? I'm just not familiar with the term getting the kids into the building and, and what specifically they do to accomplish that. What do you mean? Uh, it looks different for every kid. Yeah, uh, you know, it's like it's literally, you can't get driven to the building. I, I don't know no, that. like they, they'll be out in front of the building, and then the kids get out of the car. Okay. Or you know, this morning we had a little girl mom who was able to get into the vestibule, would not let go of mom. Okay, so they would help prior to the general. Yeah, yeah. Normally, I'm the prior if there has to be one. Um, <laughs> but you know, kind of. You know, this is once we do get the separation. How do we build in place so that it doesn't happen all the time? You know, what kind of what kind of supports? What is it that you know, the students worry about? What is it? You know, do they need transition materials? Do they need a plan where they earn something from coming in? Is a kid that benefits from having a special job? Um, it's different for having to get it's a lot of work to figure out what it is for each one. Thank you. It was really helpful for parents too because we don't know what to do. Like it's like you've never faced this before. Why do you not want to go where you've always gone willingly and happily? So I can't tell you like as someone who's really struggling and wondering what did I do wrong? Does someone tell me okay do this? Don't do that. Do this. Um, but it really does. You made an excellent point about wanting them to feel comfortable once they're in the school as well because they won't learn if they're there against their will. Right. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ace. Yeah. Um, I appreciate your time tying some of these items down to teaching and learning and to emotional well-being um, and help your, your comments help clarify this plan. Thank you. John. Excellent job. <laughs> 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 I'd say because Mr. Thompson and I have essentially these same school improvement plans directly from the um, district improvement plan, and we actually kind of talked a little bit about things that we wanted to emphasize and I wanted to pick up in terms of my school improvement plan, something that Ace has referenced and Carol referenced earlier, and that is the need to better support our literacy efforts. Uh, we're trying new literacy programs, as Ace has mentioned, we've really embarked on kind of a, a, a different philosophical approach to early literacy, and we've been very passionate about trying to empower teachers, but to do that effectively, one of the things they need is an expert. Because I know this will be a surprise to everybody. They do not believe you need an expert on early literacy. I don't understand why. Um, but they want to be, and they need someone that they can go to who's not their boss. And I think that's the most essential part of that literacy coach is someone they can go to and be vulnerable with and say, I'm not sure how to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so that's something I want to emphasize as well. Writing has been, and you heard me talk about writing when we did on CAS reports, um, an essential part of improvement in our literacy efforts. Um, and so I want to do that. The other thing that I wanted to just briefly bring to everybody's attention is that reinstatement of the special ed coordinator, um, which we've already accomplished this year, but 
how important that's been at the elementary level. Um, the individual we can add for the past several years was incredible and brilliant, but only worked one day a week in each building. And it became, it was a, a heavy burden for the principals to bear because we had to pick up all the extra stuff. The individual we hired this year, Sherry Frank, has been an amazing addition to our staff. And I thought, you know, that's a great thing that we've got in, uh, in our plan to kind of further embrace her strengths and, and improve our service to those, our needy students. Those are my two tickets. Any questions about it? Second coordinator, uh, they spend full days in your school and then full or you they travel back and forth each day. Full days. And what? Full days. Full days. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Comments? Well that was speedy, thank you. Um, I appreciate your preparing for that. And um, we take no offense if you would like to leave at this point. And Sally, thank you for coming I mean, you didn't even have a report to give. Um, but uh, if you want to leave at this point, you're welcome to if you'd like to stay, that's fine too. So thank you so that you don't spend your evening any longer than We're going to go over to the election subcommittee, do some committee subcommittee reports. Thank you. Um, so the election subcommittee uh, had a meeting last week and reviewed just the frequently asked questions that were going to be going on uh, here today. Um, and it was part of the individual session, so we am going to call the trying to provide some of the fact-based questions and answers for both voters and potential candidates. Um, as you heard Susan mentioned briefly, she, she and Lori um, had met with both the selectmen both Berlin and um, Bolton to speak about the upcoming election and get their feedback as well. Um, and we will be continuing to meet going forward to make sure we stay on top of the deadlines that we have, the primary one being in April, we'll make sure we submitted the necessary paperwork to make the election happen. So my name is Mr. Uh, yes, on the uh, any questions on the document in particular that's coming up for a vote? I just thought it was really well done. There were things in there that I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Like, yeah, it was really well done. So hopefully, it will help you explain to other people. Or you can well, about the tools the past, like the, when the last election was, and yeah, it really just laid it up plainly. Do you know in 2019 if it was just, I mean, Susan, you might know, if it was just the people running that, or I'm sorry, if it was just the people on the committee that were running, or did somebody actually lose? Were there more people than seats in 2019? Um, no, that was when I was in the um, were, you, were you running unopposed? Or? That's what I'm just wondering. Is it, are there more? No, there hasn't been more enough. seats than people. <laughs> there hasn't really been a race. I don't think. Or more people. Oh, there haven't been until the last time. Last, the last one. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the yeah. Well, that would be exciting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So that's great. Uh, thank you for that work. And um. Adam, I guess a question for you is when we vote on this, do you also want to be making a motion about um, asking the school committee to give you authority to put your, your names and emails on there in case people have questions? Sure, we need that part of the motion. And be that okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Mike, policy? Yeah, we have a policy meeting. We uh, several of the vote on tonight. Um, more on what is then we have on the K policies, uh, mostly revolving around community engagement, use of facilities, fundraising, advertising, corporate uh, news, media relations. So, if you have any questions on those or any changes that we have proposed, please ask them. Let's see, any questions first on the vote? The vote's going up for a vote tonight to D policies, finance policies. That's the first reading for. Okay, any questions on the K policies coming from first read? It's a good time to get clarification on anything if you have questions. 
And then you see also that there are four K policies that we're just noting that we're not recommending any changes for. So we're just letting you know that we did take a look at those. Those will stay as is. Anything else, Mike? Um, our next meeting is on the 13th, I think. What's that? The next meeting is falls in three looking at the 13th. I said the next meeting for the policy committee, I believe, is the 13th of January. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think right. We're down. We're about once a month. We get together. All right. So we're up to some kind of evaluation, Lori. So at our next meeting, which is January 11th, Jeff is going to present his quarterly update. And in your binder, I recommend you bring your binder and then pull this part out. And it would be a great place to take notes as he's speaking, because when it comes time to fill it out, you're gonna to wanna to remember all the stuff that you think you're gonna remember that he spoke about. So um, we had talked about possibly putting sticky notes on it, but because it's so, it's actually geared towards his goals this year, I think they could just write right on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend bringing the binder, pulling this out, and using it to write on and then putting it back because originally I was thinking maybe you could just bring this part, but God knows so, so many things get lost. Yeah. Um, so it's the red tab section. Um, and that's what it is. I'll try to put a reminder about that in the agenda. A few people. Um, any goals update? So, uh, we did a first read on goal number one, which is about community outreach and serving as the liaison to established groups already. Um, so that is re reposted for the review. That's up for a vote. And then I also uploaded at the sign up sheet because we said we need to sign up. If that goal is approved, um, that sheet is ready for people to sign up tonight. Um, and I, so I, what I tried to do is go get the details because I thought it might matter to you. What nights do they meet? How often do they meet? Who's a, who's a leading that group? Maybe I know that person. Um, and that might inform where we might like to um, serve as a liaison. Um, and they have questions about either of those materials? How do you tend to have people sign up or, or be appointed to each one of the I mean, what I would figure, I printed out the sheet and I figured we would just have a regular right table at the end of the meeting, just put your name in a spot if you've had time to think about it. Um, if that works for everybody, I figure it probably not going to take too long. Have you spoken with those other groups and they know this is fine? Um, not yet. Well, I, I talked with CPAC. Um, they're very happy to have somebody coming to um, join them and think, think with them sometimes about things that they need, like, like they wanted more you know, registration from Vermont and else, and we wanted to think about how to, how to get that. And it was, they were glad to have someone else to think with them about that. So I anticipate that that will be the same for the other groups. These groups used to come to school committee meetings regularly, I don't know, on a quarterly or something, and report to school committee. And we haven't done that the last couple of years, so we've lost touch. But I think people have appreciated being in touch with the school committee and having that flow. So I, I'm anticipating that they're looking forward to having this outreach. Okay, so um, the COVID dashboard. Um, let, uh, let me uh, give an update here. Um, the when Megan and I first talked with Jeff about the dashboard a while ago, we raised the question of whether the staff data should be um, posted separately from the student data. Um, and um, at the time, it seemed like that was fine, no problems. We have that data. To be included, that's why it was included in the in the chart that Megan did up. Um, when when uh, Karen and Jeff looked at the uh, dashboard mock-up now with the real numbers in there, they said, "No, 
not sure we should be including that staff data, particularly at the elementary level where the schools are so small that staff could be identified. Um, and so I checked in with our legal counsel, see if he had any words of advice there. And he said he agreed. Um, and he suggested we take the data down now to just to err on the side of caution. And um, what I'm going to propose is that we put this um, the, the content of the COVID dashboard again uh, uh, on the January agenda for a vote so that if parents want to weigh in on what should be on there, they have an opportunity to do that. I didn't want to introduce a vote to tonight's because um, you voted on it the last meeting, so I didn't feel I could just take it down without your vote. So if we're going to look for parent input, how would we go about that? Would we? Well, if the agenda is posted, and that's the obvious place. It's, it's listed on the agenda. Um, I don't have other plans for that because I'm not looking for parents to redesign the staff yeah. yeah. But I think what we're what Meg and I were talking about is to just roll the staff numbers into the student numbers so that we have a sense of COVID <coughs> in the building is the idea. And that we can differentiate staff and students, but you have a sense of the whole COVID in the building. Um, so if, if you know somebody felt strongly that no 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 the staff data should be there um, then they might want to speak to that. I didn't want to um, step over that opportunity for them um, by introducing a vote that wasn't on the agenda. I do like the explanation as to why if we don't want to separate them because that was my concern. I looked at like one staff in a certain school, it's such a small number, and right. start figuring out who's out. Right. That's what they do at the research conference. Yeah. Well, especially if you know, they're out for a week, yeah. it becomes very obvious mm -hmm. who that is. So, so what I asked um, Chrissy to do, which she's already done, is to take the report off the website. Um, and Megan is going to give her a revised version that has the um, staff and student data rolled together so that the COVID dashboard can continue to be um, up there, but not with staff. Uh, it's aggregated. Um, and then so we can revisit that um, decision formally in January. That seems okay for everybody here. So, so currently the dashboard is there is not, not we don't have any posts on the dashboard. No, she, I just fixed it and she just reposted it. Okay. There's nothing on there. Okay. Yeah, the she's she's pretty Christy Larry. She just did it, yeah. Yeah, she's kind of a wizard woman. She's <laughs> 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 fast. <laughs> 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 just so the last time we discussed this, um, there was a comment made. I think it was caring about the um fact that we still haven't seen the in school transmission. Mm -hmm. among the positive cases. Does that continue to be the case at all three schools that the cases we are seeing are assumed to be public school transmission? I can't remember the count. What are you trying to count? I did tell you that early on. I'm not sure I can still tell you that now. I'm not sure that the nurses, because of the number of cases and the numbers of testing that they're doing, I'm not sure I can tell you whether that's true or not. I don't want to check the count. I thought it a few weeks ago that we wanted to, well, we both started from the nurses. Because I asked about that same question, we've seen it in the school. Considering the amount of cases we've had, the transmission has been very low. And it's, it's a spectrum anyway. You don't know what you're sure. Yeah. I mean, I think we have challenges sometimes. We have two siblings who are also in a class together. Right. So is that a school transmission right. or is that right. a home transmission? Right. You know? I don't know. I have some um, familiarity to who seems to in. in Room transmission in the preschool setting, for example, and it's good to see that we haven't yet seen any kind of significant spike within a particular classroom related to a case in our schools today. Right. Anyone else? Okay. I mean, I'd love to see kind of going like what Adam said, and I don't know if this is possible, maybe not like public, publicize or post it as a dashboard, but just. How many actual positives are we getting out of testing today? Because that would kind of give you your possible school transmission. You know, it would just at least be kind of a starting point for, you know, giving us some visibility if there even is an inkling of any school transmission. Because I would guess if there's zero positives in a class, 
somebody has COVID in the test and say they're zero positive and there was no in-school transmission for that specific case. Um, so it would be good, you know, maybe have that data. I mean, I'm not saying now, but I'm saying like down the road, if we're going to have to vote about the masks or removing masks, if we do hit that 80%, you know, come March, it would be good to have that, that data, you know, um, if there's a case, you know, is there any possible? I know that we, we don't know for sure. No, we don't. And I think the challenge is what we're finding, why it gets a little murkier this year where they're staying in school. So we test and stay a group and they're, they're fine and fine. And then later on, one of them comes up as positive and it may or may not be from the original person. You know, there's been so much time in between. Mm -hmm. It's a little murkier to do that, but we could, um, we can report the number of test positives through the test and stay. I mean, that's a that's a definite number. That's a concrete number. Right, and I mean, you know, we talked about. I know I emailed you about false positives. So you know, that would be another. If there's a, I think, I had a personal situation. There were a lot of false positives, but I don't know if there's other situations where that happens or not. Um, and I don't know if the nurse actually goes through the process of. Um, you know, making sure they're actual positives by forcing the child to go get a PCR test. Do they have to get a PCR test if they test positive on the on the they rapid? Do. They do. If they get if they test positive on the rapid, they need to go and have a PCR test. Or they can't come back to and or they, they do the quarantine. That's or the they do the quarantine, right. right. But if the P, and then if the PCR is negative, they can go back to school. Right. So that would indicate a false positive. Yeah. So and we have as you know, we have had some false positives. Yeah. Them, and that's expected. That's why we have to send for the PCR. The PCR is really going to tell us definitively. Yeah, but I wonder what the false positive rate is, you know, versus the rate of the tests. And I don't even, like, that's the kind of data. You know, I'm a data person, so that is, but yeah, I don't even know if it's possible to get that kind of stuff, yeah. that kind of data. Yeah, and I think we're going to stick with your, your original um, concern, which is like, which I appreciate when you're thinking ahead. To a decision the school committee may, may need to make down the line, and what kind of data might we want to have to inform our decision making? And this is a, a good time to be thinking about that, right? So I'm not sure that we've nailed down the answer to that question yet. I think we're exploring some different data points here, but I think um, we should continue to think about that. What what data might be informative to us? Six months from now, three months from now. You know, for now, the number of data is interesting to see, so the reporting you're looking at, uh, for instance, Hopkins High School, where I know they've been able to remove masks at a three week period and 95% are vaccinated, and then you get to see that force them to take a step back, having them remove the mask. None of these is the data from our own district, but also the information we can glean from other schools that might be ahead of us yes. on this timeline because of their. Higher vaccination rate, and what are they now seeing in the buildings in our general community? Now, the other thing about in school transmission, if you're going to have two kids from the same group, you have kids positive and test the contact, and if you get three kids that are positive, that doesn't indicate necessarily that they were positive, that they were transmitted to school because they could be asymptomatic. And I've talked to kids in the adult who didn't know they had COVID, and their parents brought up something else and both gave the test, and, and then the kid is positive. So it could just have to be, it's in a close contact group. You already had it, you got it someplace else, or she got it someplace else. So it's, I think it sends false information out. To say, I agree because maybe two kids went to a birthday party on the weekend, and then they both have it, but they might affect themselves in there. Yeah. And still spread it to one another just because they're really contact when they're in school. It's tough. Um, I think we should probably keep this topic on the um, agenda uh, so that we can continue to uh, get updates and continue to explore other data points that we think we should be collecting that we think are secure, reliable kinds of information. Um, and with that, I think we're ready to move on. Um, okay, so we're ready to move into the business portion. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. I just wanted to point out that we um, but spent a lot of time on the questions of the operating budget. We didn't get to the capital budget, but this document on your drive. Um, so 
I can either go over it now or. Um, yeah, why don't you do that now before we get into the vote? So I'm going to do a 10,000 foot level summary. Um, so capital typically is uh, more straightforward for discrete items. Uh, so we're getting a scrubber for the floors of Boyle Snow Elementary. It's a bigger school than Berlin, and um, it's something that um, will help in terms of saving costs and also uh, improve the performance um, of the stripping of the floors and uh, finishing them. Um, <coughs> consistent issues with the roof that require repair, repairs and replacing of the metal roofing and flashing. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, that's 18,000. Um, and there's asphalt improvements. You might have seen a huge pothole. Some of those were fixed last year. Um, that's 15,000. And the last item is 25,000 for a facilities assessment, which we did at Berlin two years ago. And this is a roadmap. Uh, two years ago or a year ago, I can't remember now. Uh, that was recently met at Berlin, and it's a roadmap for the, all the capital that we need for the building over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, very helpful document, and um, with the schools getting a little bit older, we thought that would be good time for Boston as well. Uh, for Berlin, um, really the main item is uh, we're going to use the priorities for identifying the building assessment by the consultants uh, that assess the building. and address the level two priorities uh, that are remaining, uh, which is mainly related to the entry, egress areas, um, and socket at the main entrance in the west and east side uh, doors. Um, and um, that's 56,000. The second one is in entrance access control security. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe this stems from discussions we have with the emergency planning committee with police and fire. Um, and that's twelve thousand uh, dollars. It would it would create um, so again I'm going to ask me about this. There's if you um, have been to Boylston Elementary when you go in the first door, it's locked. You have to get access to it. And then there's uh, uh, the principal's office, secretary, or some whoever's staffing that will see you and buzz you into the second door. That's considered kind of the ideal security to have for a school. So you have you get admitted to the school and then you have to be seen uh, before you're. Admitted again. We don't have that at Berlin Memorial or to Hanta. Uh, this is the cost we've got to go to to install that at Berlin Memorial. Um, we'll, we'll also look at this a little bit because where the, step, where the person in the front desk sits in Berlin, it's not right next to where the entrance is. Um, so this is one that's um, it's on here. That's what it would cost. Um, we have to continue to think about that one and see how. Um, whether that's going to make sense with where Judy sits. We're not going to install a home seating location uh, in that vestibule. You can ring the door up for 200 bucks, Paul. What's that? Yeah. You can ring the door up for 200 bucks. That's a really good point, actually. You can see when you have the ring doorbell, you can see on your computer or on your phone who's, who's there. Someone's going outside. Yep. Yeah. The person's outside, he's saying because they have in, at BES, you can come in from the elements and then you get to be seen, and then you go. There's two doors, but I get what you're saying. Huge yeah. cost savings. <laughs> you know, I, I understand. But I mean, if, if, you're, if, you're in the, if you're in the vestibule, um, somebody will physically see you. Um, yeah, but then you're out of the building, you want us to be there. See for yeah, I know. Okay, I see what you mean for Berlin, right? Yeah. I think some of this, this cost is just with seeing the person is the security of the second door. Right? Yeah, no, it's not. No, you're not sure I was saying that. Right, right. You know, that, that's not factored in at all. Like, I guess right. I'm questioning. Okay. Um, this is this is for the security building and everything. I think it's the security. You started talking about that. I thought that was factored in. Okay. Um, we have the same amount in Tahanto. It's a little bit more expensive, seventeen thousand. Um, we also have these rooftop units that were installed in the building spot, and it seems that we're cycling through and replacing them regularly. So this is to um, replace, I believe, three motors on those rooftop units. The fan motors seem to have a life of life for close to 10 years, it appears. Um, so this would replace three of those. Um, and the last item is the debt service on the building bonds. That's kind of an ongoing item that we have every year. Uh, so in total, the Increases 1.9% for Tahanto, 0% for Berlin, and 
cost in the 7.7 percent for five thousand uh, dollars i don't anticipate a lot of pushback from the towns on capital uh, the dollars uh, they might have specific questions about some of these but uh, their feedback has been uh, their focus is on the operating budget this year and the um, this like this is cherry access this did come from our conversations with our crisis management team out in first responders and it was one of two uh, of the lower cost items that we could use to increase the security in the building. The other one was the film, the security films on all of the first floor windows so you can't dash through them. And that's been done. That was done a couple summers ago. So yeah, that's that's on, on the first floor. So that's that piece of the second piece. Are those doors bulletproof? Like that glass that boils out of the ceiling? Yeah. 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 It's not bulletproof, but it will, uh, you can't. Into the bus door. Yeah, we'll chat. Okay, any other questions on the capital expenditures here? I haven't been to Lewis. Can you tell me about the asphalt repairs, the continual repairs? Um, it's cracked, it's got holes, um, significant divots. You know, I don't know. So these are pot holes. Pot hole filling? Or just... Some of it's potholes. There's, there's like uh, just cracks that are continuing to erode more, like significant cracking uh, throughout the lot. Um, we prepared one section of it last year with another section that needs to be done next. We're trying not to do like a whole repaving. Um, I is can. The, uh, is the town highway department ever help with that kind of thing? Or? Um, we've asked, um, and if they're if they have the capacity to do it, they will. They have to have the capacity and the equipment to do it. Um, and they just to do small stuff though. I mean, the access around the school. They helped it. They did help with one of the projects that uh, when we had a temporary driveway, the first time I had a temporary yeah, driveway. That's the one they were help with that. It but to permanently pave it, they, they didn't do that. We used the company. So I guess it depends on what we need done. Um, you know, we can certainly ask. Yeah. So this is just repairs though? Like, you're going to need these same repairs next year? Um, <coughs> probably this wouldn't be the last one there. Um, I don't know they don't really continue indefinitely. Um, so is there a reason not just repay it? What's that? What's the cost of just repaying it versus fifteen thousand a year? Oh, uh, based it? on my like previous experience at other jobs, like you do a parking lot, it could be a couple hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't think we need to do that at, at this point. Um, it's not a huge lot. Um, but there's also the drive down to the street. Um, You're talking about the back, right? Well, Where the playground is? There, there's a road that was just paved to move around. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the side parking and the front entryway, the drive up the front entryway to loop around and, and on the side. Um, Anything else? We have included pictures of some of them. Previous budget presentations. I mean, I could, I could include some of the next uh, open hearing meeting. I think we're um, ready to move on. Okay. Thank you, Bob. We're circling back to that. Sorry, I forgot that. Um, so let's go on to uh, business items then and uh, uh, start with the D policies that are for vote tonight. Um, I'm just going to leave it to you to look at this list on our agenda and just call out a motion, call out a second. We'll go through like that. I won't, I won't ask for each one. Let's just go ahead and take the lead, you guys. The point of order. Are we unable to do one motion to approve all of them? Um, Christy, do you know if we can vote for all of them? My experience has been no, but I have not. Um, no. I've never done that. Before. No. I make a motion to approve items A through H on the agenda. Second. Uh, discussion? Any items there you can call out? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, pass. Thank you, Adam. Um, and we have a motion to accept the ESSER three grant funds of two hundred sixty-eight thousand eight hundred sixty-eight dollars. So, second. Okay. Second. 
Summer programming grant by fifteen thousand dollars. So moved. Second. <laughs> a discussion. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We passed up the BNS lease not on the vote list tonight. So we'll move on to school committee goal number one. Uh, the document title: Outreach Goal. Um, we have a motion to accept goal one as presented in the shared drive. So moved. Second. And discussion? I could just kind of think this is great that we're moving this way. This is a big step forward. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The FAQ document from the election subcommittee. Motion to accept the consent document. So moved. Second. All right. A discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Uh, motion to accept the emergency connectivity fund grant of $44,699.46. So moved. Second. Can I? Uh, yeah. That's a typo. Oh, sorry. So, they talked about it. And I don't know whether like both letters didn't come, but if that is one piece of it. That's for the Chromebook, and there was an additional twenty-seven hundred dollars for the um, hotspots funding, which okay. brings the total to that forty-seven three ninety-nine thirty-six. Okay, got it. Okay, motion to accept the emergency connectivity fund grant of forty-seven thousand dollars three hundred ninety-nine. $47,399.36. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? Thank you for catching that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Now, the annual report for the towns. Uh, well, this is a draft. Um, uh, just as a background, uh, Jeff read it. And um, a couple of other people uh, in Rome, I ran it by them. Um, because what I was really looking for was somebody to hack it back because I feel it's long. But um, the nobody had suggestions for it to cut out. They felt actually that it was all useful. Um, so uh, I'm going to just open up for. Um, Feedback, but uh, if it's if it's editorial feedback, it's best to just download the document, put in track changes, and send it to me. That's easy to do. We don't need to take discussion time for that. But in terms of the content, um, if there are things that are missing, that you think are essential, or things that you think don't belong there, or whatever, uh, let's just open it up for feedback because I need to bring the final version of this back to the I, this is great, and I think that I, I wish I had an eye on it when I joined the committee. It was one of the things I did. There's a lot of really valuable factual information here that people have come to learn, but I didn't necessarily know in one place, so this is a great place for them to be. Great. Thank you. It's a lot of work, so this is yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was that long. Really? No. Well, yeah, for an annual report. Tell. I well, don't. and you can't tell when it gets translated to the town report when they reformat it or different, you know, different pages, uh, whether it will come out looking like this or something else. Any other suggestions or direction? Okay. Um, 
I thought I might run it by the person in Vermont who puts the town report together. Just get her feedback as whether the length is acceptable. Um, and then, so this will come out for a January vote, and then it has to go sent right in. All right, well, thank you for taking the time to read that and think about that. Um, and I just want to note that in the upcoming meetings, um, in January, remember that the January 25th meeting was given to a governance workshop um, with Dorothy Presser facilitating around uh, helping uh, this week to just articulate the <coughs> what community engagement means to us, what we're aiming at collectively. And um, we also have a social media policy I think we want to take a look at, discuss whether that needs to be vision in, in alignment with that vision. Um, and I'm thinking that uh, it would be good for that to be three hours rather than two so that we can actually complete work there and not have to bring it out into the school committee unless it gets assigned to specifically a sub a subcommittee. Um, but I think we could actually feel like we had enough time to really wrap up our thinking if we went for three hours. Um, and then February also it's two meetings because of the budget hearing on uh, February 15th. And that's just one week after the school committee meeting because the following week is vacation. And then I think we're back to one meeting a month for a couple of months there. Um, any other issues or agenda items you want to put on the table tonight as we plan forward? All right. Well, I think we're in good form. Um, I will have another training call before the January meeting because those have been useful so far. People have raised questions that we've then got to forward over to uh, Jad for someone on the leadership team so they can address those when they come to school. <coughs> you can share resources. Um, so we'll just continue those a little bit longer. Is that where that letter to the uh, Attorney General came from? Were those what those that? Is that where that letter came from? Did it come from there? Uh, that's where I shared it. Yeah. I, I sent it out to the committee and then yeah. I shared it with, uh, at that meeting. So did, did I read that right? So we didn't need to actual public meeting notices for the work we were going to be on. did because you were a subcommittee, I thought. Not, not the subcommittee. The, uh, Document. Oh, the document. And right. your meeting with the town. Yeah, that, that, that was one of the cases. There were a couple of cases at the same time. Yeah. Lori and I were going so to So my correct you, you didn't need an actual meeting for that? No, it's public notice. Um, I, I no, know. I think from the attorney general's advice that you we did need it to be a public meeting because you were, even though you weren't appointed a subcommittee, you were going to develop. Um, discuss school committee content and develop uh, uh, recommendation back to the school committee. So you were advising the school committee, and that's why it needed to be a public meeting. Whereas Lori and I, when we were going to do a presentation, we weren't discussing any content that was going to come back to the school committee. Okay. It's very subtle. I think it's uh, um, useful to continue thinking and learning about because it's I, I every year I've ever been on school committee we end up talking about what we need more and how I'm writing to Christy all the time. How is it how does this work? So um, I thought it was pretty nuanced the attorney general's advice. So I think we should just keep keep thinking about it, keep raising the question do we need this to be open and this is okay. Um, the other thing that Attorney General's guidance uh, pointed to was that you have to be aware of your subcommittee relationships, not just your committee relationships. So if um, uh, Mike and Adam were to um, be talking together, they they are not a quorum of the large committee, but they are a quorum of the election subcommittee. And so their conversation should be privy to open the law. So lots of subtleties, I think, for us to pay attention to. All 
All right, so on that note, I think we'll move on and um, adjourn the meeting. Is that a motion? Is that a motion to adjourn? Second from Laura. Okay, there we go. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Okay, we will adjourn at 8.55.